Hello everyone, welcome to the second uh, lecture on natural language processing. This time we'll be dis discussing prompting of large language models. Um, well, you might ask yourselves, well, what is so interesting about prompting? Prompting seems to be pretty obvious, you just <coughs> uh, you just ask the large language model with a prompt and it answers. Uh, I hope to convince you that the subject is much more interesting uh, that there is uh, much more to it uh, and that it's definitely worth uh, looking into. So let's get started. First we have to go back a little bit in time to observe the history of uh, model training for uh, natural language processing. Now if we go back 10 years in time uh, we will find ourselves in the epoch of fully supervised learning. That was the major paradigm uh, of uh, machine learning uh, models. Basically, uh, for each task, for each problem, we would train a task-specific model, we would collect the data set, the data set would be fully labeled with input and output examples, and then we would start working on a, on a model. Uh, of course, the quality of the model would depend uh, directly on the quality of features. So the feature engineering was crucial uh, for uh, providing the inputs to uh, machine learning models, especially in the situation where we didn't have um, uh, large enough um, data sets. Um, so how could we push the model into the direction uh, of solving the specific task that we were interested in, uh, be it, for instance, the tagging, like NER tagging, or uh, text classification, or even text generation. Well, the only, the only thing we could do was to introduce this inductive bias through features. So we would spend a lot of time engineering new features, trying to come up with uh, clever ways of turning the text into features, uh, things like the bag of words, then of course the count vectorization, then the TFIDF vectorization, uh, then all kinds of uh, matrix decomposition. Um, all these uh, things were utilized to produce uh, high quality features. And that was basically the dominant approach before 2010. Now, what happens in 2010 was a sudden change. <clears throat> now, that was the, around the time uh, when uh, neural networks came back to the uh, focus of, of computer science and artificial intelligence. Um, then it came out that we can just train a single model, uh, and this single model can have an architecture which is optimized for a given task and the features themselves will be learned automatically by the model. So the salient text features, and salient here meaning important, um, the, um, discriminative, these features can be learned jointly with the training of the model. So as the model uh, goes through the data set and, and consumes the data, it also automatically finds the combinations and correlations in the data uh, that are then uh, presented in the model. Uh, for instance, in the patterns of uh, co-activation um, of, uh, of neurons in the neural network. Now, what I mean by architecture engineering? Now, uh, here, because we understand perfectly that uh, text classification is something different from uh, sequence tagging, which is different from uh, text generation. For each task, or general task, we would come up with a clever model. For instance, if we were to do sequence tagging, and the sequence tagging depends on a larger context, we would use recurrent neural networks and specifically, for instance, long short-term memory cells because they had this ability to uh, remember important elements and the parameters of those cells were trainable. So we could, just by putting more data, we could train them better and um, have uh, and discover larger uh, relationships between between words or tokens in the input sequence. So um, LSTMs, GRUs, stuff like that, that was basically the approach between 2000, 2010 and 2000 and 
2018. Now, we all know what happened in 2018. This is the year the Transformer model has been created. So, that was the yet another shift in the paradigm of training uh, large language models or language models in general. And the idea was uh, let's not experiment with different architectures, let's have just a single architecture. And this architecture it can be used to pre train a, a, a large model. And specifically, uh, this architecture is used to create a language model. So the language model, as you know, is a very specific type of model which uh, generates in an autoregressive manner um, the sequence. It gets something, a sequence of tokens as an input, and as a response, it generates other sequences of tokens. And the idea is, of course, that it tries to model the language, so it, it <clears throat> predicts the next token based on the probabilities of the tokens that were uh, that were uh, previously uh, seen in the input sequence. So, uh, as you can see in this uh, little Im uh, image here in the top, uh, now instead of having specific uh, architectures, one architecture per uh, NLP task, we have just a single model. Now, what we have to do is we have to reformulate the problem in the context of the language model. So we have to turn the language model in such a way that it can be used for text classification, for sequence tagging, or for text generation. And the text generation, of course, is the natural application of the language model. Um, the model learns general features, so they are not task specific, they are very general. They, uh, the model learns them from huge corporal data, so that was the, the next <coughs> big thing. Uh, it turned out that we need uh, very, very large collections and corporal data to efficiently train these large language models. And given a very specific downstream task, for instance, text summarization or text classification or span classification or relational entailment or what have you, what we would do is we would do the fine tuning. So we would take a little bit of additional data, the data that would be task specific, and maybe, presumably, we would also create a training objective function that also was specific for a given task, which led us to, again, turn from feature engineering to architecture engineering and now to objective engineering. So in objective engineering, we're trying to, <coughs> uh, to modify the loss function in such a way that it pushes the general purpose language model into the direction of the downstream task we are interested in. Um, as an example, if you want to create a model which summarizes the text, it turns out that during, uh, during fine-tuning you can change the objective function and instead of traditional masked language modeling, uh, you can, for instance, predict the salient uh, sentences from the text. If you have even a reasonably small data set with uh, paragraphs of text and extracted salient features, again salient sentences, the important sentence from the text, and if you force the model to use this as an objective function, uh, the, uh, the, the performance of the model on the task of text summarization uh, grows significantly. So this idea of pre-train and fine-tune was dominant for four years. So as you can see, these uh, elements of time also get shorter and shorter. So now we are in 2022. What happens? Now, of course, a large language model happened. And these large language models, although of course they were developed even before, <clears throat> now suddenly we again changed the tune and said, why do we want to fine tune? The, what we can do is we can completely change the downstream task. Instead of modifying the objective function of the language model, we can completely rewrite the downstream task and remodel those downstream tasks in such a way that they look ideally like the training objectives uh, for the language model. So if we can create a prompt, and this prompt looks exactly like the model training objective, and this prompt helps us to solve the downstream task, for instance, the test classification, or sentiment classification, or uh, named entity recognition, or entity linking, or whatever. Then we can use the source large language um, to perform this task via prompt engineering. So again, 
we started with feature engineering, then we went through architecture engineering, then through objective engineering, and now, as of today, we are at prompt engineering. So the large language model is, of course, trained in a self-supervised uh, manner, and uh, the same model can be used for a variety of downstream tasks. Um, let's now go through some terminology that we'll be using throughout this lecture. So uh, the input and output, that is obvious, like input is something and we, we give the language model, the output is uh, the label that we expect. For instance, uh, if inputs are short texts, which are reviews, then I can imagine the output being one of five possible um, values, for instance, very positive, positive, neutral, negative, and very negative. A prompting function is a function that takes an input and turns it into a prompt. So usually it is a, uh, a text, uh, some kind of a text with placeholders for specific uh, inputs, right? Uh, for a single input or for several inputs. So the prompt is the result of applying the prompting function to a given input. For instance, if I have a prompting function which creates a string of characters saying placeholder, overall it was a placeholder movie. Now, if I apply it to the I love this movie input, then I get the prompt. And the prompt says I love this movie, overall, overall it was a Z movie. And now I can send this prompt to the large language model. If the large language model has been trained with a masked uh, language um, objective, then of course it can perfectly predict the most probable word that should fill the placeholder Z here. So I can have a filled prompt um, and one possible uh, filling would be I love this movie overall it was a bad movie or it could be uh, I love this movie overall it was a good movie. So filled prompt is a prompt with any answer from the language model and the answered prompt is the one that we expect it to be right this is the one that we have in the uh, test uh, data set and the answer is the particular token that the large language model provides then we have of course to do the mapping so now we have to map or project the answer onto the domain of uh, labels for instance um, we can verbalize several terms like good, fantastic, cool, wonderful to a very positive, then uh, okay, possible as, as positive, then mech as a neutral, and of course boring, for instance, as a negative, and so on and so forth. Right? So this is self-explanatory. So uh, general steps, very simple. We begin with a prompt addition, so we take the inputs, we transform the input using the prompting function. The input can be inserted in the middle of the template, then we refer to such a prompt as a close prompt, um, or the, uh, the input can be appended at the end of the prompt, then we call it the prefix prompt. The prefix prompt because the prompt goes before the input, right? And then we start doing the answer search. Uh, in the answer search, of course, we are trying to find the token, which is the best filling, uh, the most probable filling over all words or tokens that are in the vocabulary of the large language model, given the parameters of the model. As you can see, the parameters of the model do not change. So we do not do any fine tuning, right? There is a, a pre-trained model and we don't touch it. The theta, which represent the model here, the set of parameters, the set of weights, is not being changed. And as the last step, we need to uh, map the answer into the onto the uh, set of uh, possible labels, right? So, or for instance, if we are doing the uh, named entity recognition, then we have to <clears throat> find the demarcation of the entity span. If we are doing the uh, generation, then we have to decide where to stop the generation. If we do the uh, language translation, for instance, then we decide where is the end of the translation. 
So here are some examples of prompts for NLP tasks, uh, just to show you how versatile this solution can be. So for text classification, imagine we have a simple task of sentiment, an input, an example of an input is I love this movie, then we have a template or the prompting function, the placeholder of this movie is Z, and then we have the answer, right? So if we insert the input into the template, I love this movie, the movie is, probably the large language model will answer great, fantastic, wonderful, and so on. For topics, for topics, uh, a very simple prompt would be place the, the input, he prompted the LM dot, and then you say the text is about, and here the language, large language model should tell you science, language modeling, prompting, uh, GPT, whatever. Uh, for intention, again, there is an input and you can try to rephrase this, this input, asking, for instance, the question is about and um, hoping that the context will be large enough for the large language model that given the input, what is taxi fare to Denver? The question is about and should be about money, about uh, the price, about the fare and so on and so forth. But as you can see, we can we can uh, do much more. We can text span uh, classification. Uh, for instance, we can get the answer, the aspects of a sentiment, poor service, but good food. So here we are asking about the service, right? We put this as, a, as, as the input into the prompting function, but we ask in the prompting function, we ask specifically what about service? And of course, in this uh, case, the large one language model would say poor, bad, terrible, and so on. Uh, you can do natural language inference. For instance, given two inputs, a, a pair of inputs, an old man with with a cane, a man walks in the park, um, you can do a thing which is extremely simple. For instance, you can just have a prompting function which consists of a single uh, question mark and a single comma, right? So if you, instead of, uh, in the placeholder x1, if you put an old man with a stick, uh, with a walking cane, um, walks through the park, and then there is uh, a man walks with a dog, for instance, then the large language model should insert into the Z placeholder either yes or no, depending on the uh, on whether the first uh, the second sentence uh, supports the the conclusion of the first sentence or not, right? If uh, um, or if it's uh, if it's um, uh, basically right against it's it's not supporting the conclusion. Uh, for for tagging, right? Usually, uh, this is done by explicitly asking for an entity. For instance, Mike went to Paris. Paris is a Z entity, and the large language model should say uh, location, geographical location, something like that. And for other tasks like summarization or translation, well, for most large language models, uh, just putting too long didn't read is enough uh, to force the large language model to. Uh, do summarization and mostly this summarization will be pretty pretty okay. Uh, for popular pairs of languages you can just say French, provide the, the, the input, je vous aime, and then, uh, and then say English and hope that the language model will uh, correctly translate je vous aime into I love you. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. So what should we consider for prompting? Um, there are five things that we'll be looking at. The, <coughs> the choice of the pre-trained model, prompt engineering, answer engineering. Then we'll talk a little bit about, <coughs> sorry, about expanding the paradigm and uh, we'll close with discussing the prompt-based training strategies. So the pre-trained model, here is the typology of prompting. Um, I will go through most of those things. Uh, this is just to let you know that the subject is vast. It's not just take the input, come up with a clever way to, um, to describe what you want the large language model to do with the input and just hope for the best. Um, there is much more to it. 
So let's start at the beginning, pre-trained models. Um, as you know, the pre-trained models differ in the training objective. Uh, most uh, contemporary language models are trained using the standard language model, uh, which is basically <coughs> trying to predict the probability of the not next token in the autoregressive way by reading the input uh, sequence left to right. Now, of course, there are variations, right? You know, that there are models which are being directional, which read left to right, right to left. Uh, so they peek into the future of, um, of the sequence. Um, there can be different um, different solutions about how to compute the probability of the token and so on and so forth. Um, now, there are uh, language models which are trained using the corrupted text reconstruction, uh, reconstruction uh, objective. Here, the idea is that you take the input sequence, then you apply a noising function, and you expect the language model to denoise uh, the input. And the quality of the denoising is, of course, computed by comparing the version produced by the language model with the original, un, uh, uh, original input before the noising has been applied. Uh, and for corrupted text reconstruction, the loss uh, is computed only on the noise part of the text. This is important because uh, if you compute the loss over the entirety of the input text, then this leads to the training objective of full text reconstruction. Right? And in full text reconstruction, you can do whatever you want with the text. You can insert new tokens, you can replace the tokens, you can delete the tokens, and you ask the language model to reconstruct the original text, so to go through all these reconstructions uh, and, uh, and roll them back. And the loss is computed for the entirety of the text. Why this is important? Because the prompting works best if you align the prompt, what the prompt is trying to do, with the training objective of the language model. So here are some examples of noising functions. Right? You can have the uh, original text, then you can depend on whether you want to mask or noise one token or up to two tokens or just one entity. So maybe several tokens, but one logical entity. Uh, and then you'll have corrupted text. Right? For instance, for masking, Jane will move to New York and will be Jane will to New York. Jane will move, Jane will relocate, Jane, Jane will drive, Jane will fly to New York, right? all these possibilities. Then you can have uh, two tokens, mask for instance, uh, or you can have uh, uh, one entity uh, being masked. You can replace uh, the, the parts of the input uh, sequence. And you can delete, for instance, one token. And instead of having original text, Jane will move to New York, you'll have Jane move to New York. And of course, if the language model is good enough, uh, it will see that uh, it is not Jane has moved, because then you'd have to have had right, or has, has moved or had moved. So the past, uh, the move verb should be uh, in the past uh, particle. Um, uh, and yeah, for Jane will move, if we delete two tokens, then of course that could be uh, restored to Jane will move to New York, Jane is moving to New York, Jane moves to New York, and so on, right? So all kinds of, of possible uh, noising is possible, and uh, the task of the language model is to reconstruct the original text. Uh, for the directionality of training, you know that it's done either left to right or uh, or bidirectional. If you want to read in, in both directions and you want to peek into the future, and left to right or bidirectional, uh, because <clears throat> almost all is done uh, in the transformer. Uh, architecture, this is usually done via attention masking. So if you have the, the self-attention uh, matrix, uh, if you allow for the full attention, then of course you allow for each token, each input token to uh, attend to whatever token uh, you had in, in your input, right? If you're 
producing the token the first token a y1 or y2 or y3 y4 and so on if as as you go producing um the next token you can uh in the in the full um attention setting you can attend to whatever token you want if you have a diagonal um attention then you restrict what you can look at on uh, looking at the at the diagonal and of course the width of the diagonal will define uh, the the width of the context so for instance in this example when producing the the y1 um, we allow only to attend to x1 when producing y2 we allow the <clears throat> attention to attend only to tokens x1 and x2 and so on and you can have a mixture right with some kind of all flexibility there um and this leads us to a full set of different solutions that we can imagine for language models depending on whether we use them uh, left to right or or we use the last uh, mask language model paradigm or prefix language model paradigm or encoder decoder so uh, for uh, left to right the, the first example here shows you the example where you have standard language model <clears throat> uh, the objective and without any noise you have the diagonal mask which defines what attends to what um, and this setting is pretty good for natural language understanding or natural language generation but you could have a mask language model where you uh, you have uh, in the input sequence you have only the tokens x1 and x3 and your task is to basically predict that what has been masked is x2 right so again the full attention mask but the noise is performed as a mask one of the tokens has been uh, has been removed or masked from the input sequence and this leads us of course uh, to the corrupt uh, corrupt text restoration uh, and the same can be done with prefix and encoder decoder the difference between prefix lang language model and encoder decoder arch architecture is that in the prefix language model the encoding and decoding is performed by the same model by the same set of weights the same uh, the same set of parameters while in the encoder decoder um, solution we expect uh, we train two separate models one to encode the input sequence and the other one to decode and these are trained independently of each other um, so let's go through uh, through things that we need to discuss when designing prompts the first and obvious thing is prompt engineering uh, so the question is how do we create an efficient uh, function for prompting that results in the best performance given some kind of a downstream task right and as uh, we've already mentioned there are two general types of uh, of prompts there are prefix prompts and close a prompts uh, prefix prompts are usually better suited for uh, text generation for instance text summarization right when you uh, when you put the prompt first read the following text and provide the summarization up to three sentences and then you provide the text for closer prompts where the placeholder can be anywhere inside the prompt this is uh, better suited for mask language modeling tasks for instance for task classification if the task of the prompting uh, method is to um, is to uh, classify the text based on a single token based on a single word then close a prompts are the way to go uh, how do we create the template of course in the simplest solution which is do the manual engineering or just sit down and write a prompt and check whether it works or not but of course we can automate the uh, the task by doing automated template learning so what is the uh, automated template learning now uh, it depends on what is the prompt in the first setting the prompt so-called the discrete prompt or hard prompt uh, this is the text right the, these are the examples of prompts that i have already shown you um, they can be 
of course written manually but you can do prompt mining so for instance you can go through your fine-tuning data set you can uh, compute some kind of uh, uh, frequency patterns like frequent item sets based on the uh, collections of words which appear together and use them as prompts you can do prompt paraphrasing so you start with a manually written prompt and then you do some kind of a change you apply the thesaurus to change the words um, you can have a a dedicated language model to rewrite the prompt right to correct the prompt to make it more explicit to make it better suited for your downstream task um, uh, some people claim that one of the best solutions is to do round trip translation so you start with a prompt written in polish you translate it automatically to french then you go from french to english and then for instance back to polish and you have a prompt this this uh, round trip translation produces prompt paraphrase right? which usually is better suited or better aligned with the vocabulary of the language model um, there are works which produce the gra gradient based search where you start with a prompt and then you change token by token in a greedy manner by doing the iterative search overall vocabulary just trying to check on some small um, validation sets if exchanging one token for another token makes the prompt better or not uh, you can explicitly ask for uh, prompt generation using some sequence to sequence models uh, many people um, use t5 uh, family of models to do this uh, or you can have some external prompt scoring via human feedback right so this is discrete prompt so the prompt is a text uh, you can also have continuous prompts these are called soft prompts and these are basically the vectors full of numbers uh, why would you want to have that well there is actually no need to have the prompts expressed in language uh, the prompt doesn't have to be embedded in language it's embedded in language just for our own sake because we understand language as a sequence of tokens but not as uh, in the truly embedded space of, of language models but you can have the prompt just like you have the embedding of the input sequence right just the vectors full of numbers so the prompts don't have to be expressed in language they don't have to be parameterized by the language model parameters so they they don't have to be encoded first into the embedding space of the language model and which is the most clever part those prompts can have learnable parameters so you can start with some beginning prompt as in the in the discrete prompt you can paraphrase the prompt or you can exchange single tokens right you take one token and you exchange it for another token here you can very very delicately tune single parameters of the prompt because the prompt is just a vector of numbers right so you can tune this on the training data you can tune the prompt to fit the downstream task so this is akin to fine-tuning it's not precisely fine-tuning because in fine-tuning we basically assume that we are changing the, the parameters of the language model or the model in general um, here we are not not changing the model the model stays the same it stays frozen right you, the only thing we change is the uh, learnable parameters of prompts so uh, one solution to, to soft uh, prompts is called prefix tuning uh, this is basically a simple idea you uh, have the input right your input example and you prepend this input with a sequence of vectors of a given length these vectors have the same length as the embedding vectors of the language model you keep the parameters of the language model frozen and you simply modify or learn the parameters of those uh, appended or prepended to, to be um, uh, to be more precise uh, prepended vectors which gives us the following uh, objective we are trying to find the best so the in in this equation uh, without the phi you would see traditional um, 
optimization of a language model, right? We are trying to maximize the probability of the output y given the input x and the uh, parameters of the model theta. Now here we are adding a new matrix of parameters. This matrix of parameters of course is the same shape as the shape of the prepended vectors and we are trying to uh, optimize those using um, using uh, this sequence of vectors. Um, this is uh, so what what this is here what this stands for is the concatenation of all uh, layers of the neural network at the time step i so if if the time step i is within the frame of the uh, of this matrix which is prepended to the uh, to the input then uh, this is this is being used so it it somehow starts the uh, or um it, it biases the answer uh, and if uh, if i falls outside of the uh, sequence of, of those vectors of the prepended vectors because this prompt is quite short then the, this is taken directly direct directly from the language model so it's just like a regular um, prediction from the language model um, some people also just use the input sequence with special tokens so they are, they are not because here you have to also initialize this sequence of vectors and it's a whole new set of problems right you know that the, the, the there are several ways the parameters of the language model or model in general can be initialized and the same goes uh, is true here right you can you can initialize those vectors in, in many different ways so some people say okay no vectors but just special tokens like you you extend the vocabulary of the language model with a special token and this token um, will produce some kind of embeddings and then you you optimize these embeddings or use those embeddings directly right so that's also possible um, there can be also prompt tuning. So the prompt tuning is the idea that we start with the discrete prompts. You define the discrete prompt as as people do. The 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 tokens get initialized, and then we start fine tuning the embeddings of the discrete prompt. Right. So this is probably the best of the two worlds. Uh, we don't start randomly. We start with a specific prompt. Uh, probably our prompt is already quite close to solving the task or at least it, it, it does the job um, maybe not the best way but but still it does the job um, and then we uh, then the fine-tuning just works on the embeddings of this original discrete uh, prompt and uh, yeah the final uh, the final approach uh, that has been mentioned in the literature so far is uh, hard soft hybrid tuning here the idea is that you have hard prompt templates but from times to times you can insert into the hard template you can insert a tunable embedding so again like a special token uh, that gets embedded to a special embedding and then um, you can even have task oriented anchor tokens so special tokens which are for instance for name identity recognition or for instance if you do the uh, coreference uh, resolution and you want to have a special token that uh, that decries different types of, of dependencies between between tokens um, and uh, there are even people who suggest using sets of heuristics and logical rules uh, to improve hard prompts uh, so such such works can also be found uh, so we've defined the prompts we have filled the prompts either hard prompt or soft prompt we send it to the language model and the language model goes back with the answer so now we have to do the answer engineering we have to to map the answer onto the space of uh, class labels uh, or whatever the expected output is so first we have to decide what is the shape of the answer so whether we want a single token whether we want a span of tokens maybe we want a sentence maybe we want a paragraph a sequence of sentences right so this is the first decision now, the next one is the space of the answers so it can be unconstrained so we allow the language model to produce whatever it wants and so there will be no answer mapping because we don't know what we'll get back right 
but sometimes it's it's expected like in text generation summarization um, extractive or or abstractive summarization and so forth now it could be a constrained space right so we provide it with a set of expected answers and we expect the answer to be in the given set and then we just map the answers to uh, class labels um, if we do the unconstrained space then we can uh, also engage in uh, answer search and the answer search usually is either done by answer paraphrasing so we take the answer and we try to paraphrase it to better match the the heuristics that that allows us to make the final decision what this answer means whether the sentiment of the of the phrase is is positive neutral or negative uh, whether this span contains for instance overlapping entities whether this part is a correct translation of this text from english to for instance german um Pruned and search, it's basically, uh, this is done via verbalization, and verbalization here means uh, mapping, creating vocabularies of words, for instance, uh, words which uh, can be interpreted as, as positive uh, sentiment, uh, words which represent negative sentiment, and words which represent neutral sentiment, right? And then you just map the words into those classes. Um, sometimes it can be labeled a composition. You can ask the model to produce a more complex output. For instance, you can just simply say, uh, give me back the JSON object with the following keys. And then you extract the keys and, and turn the, the answer into a structured answer, right? Give me back the, the uh, row of the table, give me back a, a graph, give me back an RDF tuple. Right? The language model can produce answers not only as a pure text, but you can ask for whatever um, output uh, structure you want. And sometimes it, it even works better if you ask uh, for a structured answer right away. But of course, then you have to do the parsing, right? to decompose the label into constituent parts. Uh, the next thing is multi-prompt learning. Um, and this is, again, quite obvious. If you have a single prompt and you can never be sure that the single prompt works, maybe, just maybe combining several prompts will work better. Uh, we have four major approaches to multi-prompt learning. The first one is prompt ensembling. In prompt ensembling, we just produce several prompts and we aggregate the answers from the prompt. For instance, uh, if we have the inputs, and we want to extract the relation is capital from the subject China. So find what is the uh, capital of China. You can ask this question in many ways. China's capital is, or X is the capital of China. The capital of China is X. And then we just throw all these prompts at the language model and try to, um, to, to combine the answer, coalesce the answer into a single token. We can have prompt augmentation and pro pro uh, prompt augmentation sometimes is uh, mistakenly called the few shot learning this is not few shot learning this is not learning in learning we change parameters here we don't change parameters this is just um, instance-based learning or um, uh, there is, I have it in the slides, there is another another name, sometimes people refer to this idea. Basically, you just prime the language model with a couple of examples of what you expect to get, right? So you show that 1 plus 1 equals 2 and 2 plus 5 equals 9 uh, with the hope that the language model will fixate on those examples, on the tokens like plus sign or equal sign and produce the correct results. Uh, you can have prompt composition. So the prompt composition tries to break down a more complex task into a sequence of simpler tasks. For instance, you have the input. Google became the subsidiary of Alphabet. And you decompose this into a sequence of, um, of uh, prompts like hmm, Google the Alphabet and Google hmm, Alphabet. Right? And then this can be composed into a larger prompt and finally prompt decomposition this is the other way around so we have an input mike went to new york yesterday we have a prompting function mike is entity type and new york is entity type so as you can see here we should get two masked 
uh, words and we want to decompose them into the uh, the first one the, the person entity and the other one ge geographical location entity um, so prompt ensembling the first solution just let me briefly uh, remind you uh, where you have several independent prompts uh, multiple unanswer prompts for one single input we do the inference and make final prediction and of course we have to average somehow the the answers um, this can be do done by uniform averaging it can be weighted averaging if you believe that some prompts work better this can be done by the majority voting this could be even done by some kind of a knowledge distillation uh, where you uh, where you combine and, and compare the the output the results um, to for instance some knowledge base or something like that uh, for prompt augmentation oh, okay demonstration learning that was the term i was looking for the demonstration learning uh, again we are providing a set of examples uh, and these examples prime the language model into uh, into correct answer so here there is a problem of sample selection unfortunately there are several works which show because what we know is that demonstration learning works and almost always you get a much better result with prompting with simplest hard prompting if you provide a few examples first the problem is that uh, there are detailed experiments which show you that the choice of examples i call it few shot uh, setting um please please do not confuse this with few shot learning uh, few shot learning is basically trying to learn with a very very small data set here this few shot means these few examples these few demonstrations so the choice of those examples can very very strongly influence the performance when i mean significantly influence the performance i mean for the same language model for the same task the selection of examples to be demonstrated to the model can push the model from 99 percent accuracy to random accuracy right um, the few shot examples that are provided can be either positive or negative when positive that then that means that they will be aligned with the task that we're trying to solve and for negative um, they will be yeah, negative right the opposite of what we want to to get and even the ordering of samples can have the influence on the performance so people usually suggest doing different permutations and scoring those permutations against some kind of validation data set so it's not as easy as it seems uh, prompt composition the composition this is simple you just use several prompts to perform to, to to divide a larger task into more manageable smaller uh, tasks and with the composition uh, this is done the other way around the prediction is performed for a single input and we have a prompt which produces several outputs and we decompose this uh, this more holistic larger prompt into smaller prompts and each of those prompts performs the prediction independently and that that is pretty easy um, nothing to be discussed here so uh, training strategies from uh, for prompt learning uh, this is uh, a little bit complex because if if we take the case of soft prompts so in theory we can train them and we have a language model and of course we can train the language model and we have a prompt with parts of it being hard right in text this gives us several possibilities so the first example and that was the beginning of prompting is something called promptless fine-tuning so the language model is fine-tuned to the downstream task and we do not provide any additional prompt parameters and we don't tune prompt parameters and this has been done successfully with older models such as elmo or bert or bart and, and so on then we can have tuning free prompting and in a tuning free prompt prompting we take the pre-trained uh, language model which is frozen without any training we 
um, and then we provide it with prompts which are um, which are basically uh, yeah, hard prompts right so no um, we're not using any any fine-tuning of prompts uh, or any additional examples and this is something that is being done today people just playing around in, in OpenAI uh, playground with GPT-3 or GPT-3.5 or Llama or Autoprompt whatever then we have fixed LM prompt tuning so again the language model is fixed we don't change it just use the pre-trained model but we train the prompts and here there are solutions and and uh, libraries such as prefix tuning or prompt tuning they basically do uh, exactly that they modify the uh, the weights of the prompts we can have fixed prompt lm tuning so this is doing the other way around this is a rare solution but there are papers that suggest this solution so you keep the uh, prompts frozen and you fine-tune the language model and finally prompt and lm fine-tuning this is basically where you take the pre-trained model and you provide it with prompts and then you fine-tune both the prompts and the model at the same time so uh, starting with a um, with the first solution promptless fine-tuning so there's there are no prompts you just use the language model fine-tuned on a downstream task without any prompts um, it's simple it's well understood it's supported by all major libraries uh, we can because we're just fine-tuning the large language model we can fine-tune it to, to large training data sets and we don't have to do anything with prompts and um, yeah, the problem here is that first of all the language model can overfit during fine-tuning so it can memorize the, the fine-tuning data set sometimes the the training is not stable and this setting is prone to something called catastrophic forgetting which is um, basically uh, the, the solution where you lose the information from the original uh, training of the language model for tuning free prompting this is the, the simplest solution as I said you just generate the answers you don't uh, fine-tune the language model you have simple prompts sometimes you augment the prompt with these additional examples to perform in context learning and that's it right efficient simple no fine-tuning no parameter updates uh, if you don't have any labeled examples so zero shot uh, setting it's also working there is no forgetting of larger context disadvantage well you have to spend a lot of time doing prompt engineering and if you have huge training uh, data sets this can be costly and pretty pretty slow because basically um, doing learning and even doing inference via prompting is very very slow if we engage in fixed LM prompt tuning then what we do is we fine-tune the language model and then we use uh, fixed prompts on the fine-tuned language model so this is efficient learning uh, this works if you have a, even a small data set that you will fine-tune uh, on because it will push the language model into the vocabulary specific for a given uh, domain and the prompts can even further push the language model into the task that it, uh, it is supposed to, to perform um, but uh, if you take the general language and you fine-tune it to a specific task you may lose performance on other tasks and uh, unfortunately you still have to do a lot of prompt engineering in this in this uh, solution and finally fine-tune both language model parameters and parameters of the prompt this is very expressive this allows you to to have even a small model but, but very strong and uh, this works especially well where you have a lot of data right? uh, and this data can be used to both push your language model into the desired territory and also optimize the prompts for your downstream tasks uh, this may overfit to small data sets but other than that there are no major uh, disadvantages um, and to complete the lecture let's take a look at the applications of prompts and things to be worried about so 
where do we use prompts? Um, the answer, the short answer is you can do anything you want with prompts. And prompt learning can do knowledge probing, it can do question answering, it can classify the text, it can instruct, extract information like named entity recognition, for instance, or entity linking. It can do reasoning in NLP, for instance, the um, natural language inference task. It can generate tasks. It can even do multimodal learning where you have, for instance, images and text. So prompting can be applied, for instance, to, to text, but produce images or vice versa. And there are also some interesting meta applications. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. So. Here are examples of prompts that can be used for prompt uh, fact probing. This is pretty obvious. Now for text classification, uh, here you have slightly uh, slightly different uh, solutions. For instance, if you have a set of class uh, labels A, B, and C, then you can say, for instance, which of these choices best describes the following document? And then you say class A, B, C, here are the the placeholders for the names uh, or the labels and then you provide the uh, two placeholders the first placeholder is filled with inputs and the second placeholder is for the large language model to provide the answer right and the answer says for instance class b this is the best one um, text classification for description how the text can be described this passage is about again you can you can force the language model to summarize the text uh, you can just ask about whether it's positive or negative uh, or do the prompting it was like you put the, the example x the, i hated this movie it was z and yeah, the language model should answer terrible for natural language inference, as I said, uh, you can have prompts between two sentences, x1 and x2, and in the in the middle you can have uh, verbalized uh, answers from the language model, yes, no, or maybe, dependent uh, depending on whether uh, the x1 entails uh, x2 or or not. Um, for common sense reasoning. Uh, this is a nice example. The trophy doesn't fit into the brown suitcase because it's too large. Now the language model can fit two nouns there, either trophy or suitcase. And in theory, it should quote unquote understand that not fitting because it's too large, it's not the problem of the suitcase because if the suitcase were too large, the trophy would have fit. Um, and or and ask Mary what time the library closes because someone has forgotten now yeah Mary if Mary has for had forgotten the library closing time then of course it would make no sense asking Mary for that time um, there is also the linguistic uh, knowledge probing data sets and benchmarks we'll be discussing this during the subsequent uh, lectures and you can you can use prompting to to get the answers from the language model here are some some more examples for a named entity recognition you can ask for explicitly this is it this entity or not this kind of entity and you expect certain answers like person location organization so forth uh, for question answering yeah usually yes no Right, and this is the answer. For summarization, you can ask summary, too long, didn't read, in summary. And for machine translation, again, usually very, very simple uh, prompts with English, French uh, should, should work. And finally, what are the challenges of prompt learning? Now, obviously, the prompt design. Uh, starting with a very, very simple prompts through... Uh, hybrid prompts, a little bit of hard prompts and soft prompts, and finishing with uh, with soft prompts and and uh, tuning of those prompts uh, answer engineering yes it still remains a challenge because uh, because you have to uh, be able to map even very complex answers from the language model uh, onto the downstream task uh, space uh, selection of tuning strategy again as more and more models and more and more uh, training objectives are um, are available then uh, the selection will play a role uh, multiple prompt, prompt learning yeah this is the beginning of the uh, 
uh, of the work. Uh, most of uh, currently available libraries um, actually do not allow for multiple prompt learning, so you have to do this by hand. Uh, but I, I assume that in a, in a short time uh, you'll have multiple prompt, prompt learning uh, as, a, uh, as a tool or uh, in the API. Mm, there are some questions about the transferability of prompts, whether prompts that work miraculously on one task, can you just transfer them to another task, can you paraphrase them to do slightly, uh, slightly different things. Um, how to calibrate the prompting methods because the answers from the langu uh, large language model is not calibrated because the probabilities are not calibrated. Uh, so since the answers are not calibrated, e the, the language models tend to go for the more frequent and the more frequent does not necessarily mean more correct, right? So. Um, uh, some some initial calibration methods are being introduced and of course as always the selection of pre-trained models because you can go for the largest and latest from OpenAI but you can go for a, for a Dolly which is uh, slightly smaller but open source and and free to use so a lot of uh, a lot of different uh, solutions. So uh, yeah, this concludes our lecture on prompting. Uh, hope you now see this as a much wider and much more interesting subject than just you know writing uh, clever simple prompts to to extract data from uh, from textual documents, uh, which is basically a, a very useful and time-saving tool, but still it's not rocket science, as you may guess. Thank you very much, and as always, I'm terribly sorry for posting this so late.